What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, continuing the reading of The Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Hultzmann and published by the Mises Institute. Thanks to both. Today, Chapter 6 on Private Inflation, Counterfeiting, and Money Certificates. Part 1. Debasement. Before the age of banking, debasement had been the standard form of inflation. Debasement is a special way of altering coins made out of precious metal. To debase a coin can mean either one of two things. A. To reduce its content of fine metal without changing the imprint. And B. To imprint a higher nominal figure on a given coin. Debasement can be either intentional or unintentional. Suppose a coin maker erroneously puts a stamp of one ounce of fine gold on a quantity less than one ounce. He then produces a false coin. The certif certificate does not correspond to the content. False certification might occur here and there, but in practice, it's extremely rare. In vi virtually all the cases of debasement, the coin maker acts in full conscious of his deed. He certifies that the coin contains a certain quantity of fine metal, but he knows full well that it contains, in fact, less than this quantity. Such intentional falsification of certificates is commonly called counterfeiting. We have stressed that people cause inflation because it benefits them, though at the undue expense of their fellow citizens. This is, of course, also the reason why people become counterfeiters. The counterfeiter plans to sell the debased coin without informing the buyer about the debasement, so as to obtain in exchange for it the same amount of goods and services that one could buy with the sound coin. A fraudulent intention behind most practical cases of debasement is obvious from the techniques that are used, usually applied. The debaser does not take away some metal form of sound coin and turn it into smaller debased coins. Rather, he substitutes some base alloy for the precious metal he has taken away to preserve the false impression that the debased coin is a sound one. In the Western world, debasement was the standard form of inflation until the 17th century. It was widespread perennial in all phases of history of ancient Rome and under virtually all dynasties of medieval Christendom. And the only reason for its absence in more recent times is the modern counterfeiters could rely on, uh, on the more efficient inflation techniques of fractional reserve banking and paper money. For an in-depth analysis of the 12 major inflations from antiquity to the mid-20th century, see Richard Gatton's Inflationen, Inflations. The major debasement discussed in this book occurred in the Roman Empire, 3rd century after Christ, the Holy Roman Empire, the 15th century, Spain in the 17th century, and again the Holy Roman Empire in the 17th century. The other eight cases all concern inflation through fractional reserve banks and paper money producers. More recently, Bernholtz has reviewed the entire historical record of hyperinflation, very strong inflation entailing a collapse of the monetary system. We will discuss this below and found that all known cases, without exception, have resulted from excessive paper money production. See Peter Bernholz's Monetary Regimes and Inflation. In many cases, the counterfeiters have been private individuals, ordinary criminals. But in the larger cases, the counterfeiters have been very, the very persons who are supposed to act as guardians of the soundness of currency, the government. For reasons that we will discuss in more details when we're talking about fiat money, governments have played a far greater role in debasement than private citizens. Notice, however, that inflation in the form of debasement was moderate in comparison to the extent of inflation in the age of banking, and especially in comparison to inflation in our present age of paper money. From 1066 to 1601, the English silver pound was debased by one-third. See John Wheatley, The Theory of Money and Prices of Commerce. The last year in which a debasement took place in 1601, Wheatley noted that starting in the mid-1500s, silver was imported from the Americas, where the mines of Pot Potosi had been discovered in 1527. 
In the latter half of the 1600s, banking came into play. In other words, in this period, stretching over more than 500 years, the English king inflated the money supply by a factor of 0.3. By contrast, in the subsequent 200-year period, which saw the emergence of modern banking, the factor was in order of 16. And in the mere 30 years prior to 1973 to January 2003, the US dollar, M1, increased almost by a factor of five. Don't even want to know the recent numbers. M1 increased from 252 billion in January 1st, 1973, to 1.226 or to 1,226 billion, January 3rd, 2003. During the same period, the federal debt increased from 500 or 449 billion in December 1972 to 6,228 billion on September the 13th, oh, September 30th, in 2002. The sources are what they publicly tell you from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, the Bureau of Public Debt. Fractional Reserve Certificates, that's part two. Let us now turn to the important case of the inflation of certificates that are not physically integrated with the monetary metal. In the case of debasement, we can here distinguish between intentional and unintentional inflation emphasizing again that the later case is of no greater practical importance. The only realistic scenario for unintentional inflation is that, is that of a note-issuing note bank that is robbed without noticing the robbery. While the ignorance lasts, the quantity of its notes is larger than its reserves, and thus there is inflation. As soon as the robbery is discovered and becomes publicly known, the owners of the bank will have to redeem the notes out of their own money, lest they go bankrupt. Either way, the inflation disappears. Virtually all of the false certificates that are discon uh, disconnected from the certified money are counterfeit certificates. The issuer of these certificates knows that he does not hold enough reserves of money to redeem all of his certificates at once. The amount of money he keeps on hand to satisfy any demand for redemption represents just a fraction of the amount that he certified he had on hand. We can therefore call his certific her certificates fractional reserve certificates. Although fractional reserve, token coins, and other physical embodiments have played a certain role in monetary history, they cannot match the importance of fractional reserve banknotes and fractional reserve demand deposits. We will therefore largely focus on the latter. For an analysis of historical issue of false certificate by fractional banks, fractional reserve banks from antiquity to the 18th century, see Jesus Huerta de Soto in the great book Money, Bank Credit, and Economic Cycles, especially chapter two. There is some evidence that the money changer mentioned in the New Testament, see Matthew 25 to 27 and Luke 19:23, were in fact fractional reserve banksters, see Anthony Holm on morals and money. From the counterfeiter's point of view, falsifying money certificates that are physically connected with the certified quantity of money has two great shortcomings. It is relatively expensive and it is relatively easy for the other market participants to discover the fraud and avoiding using these coins. These problems dwindle once our counterfeiter turns to falsifying certificates that are not physically connected to money. Falsifying banknotes, for example, might require a considerable initial investment in time and money to create a suitable pro prototype. But once the prototype is there, it can be reproduced in virtually unlimited numbers and at great profits because the marginal cost of producing additional banknotes is close to zero. Moreover, in the case of paper certificates, extensions of the money supply are more difficult to perceive than in the case of certified certificates directly attached to the metal. Debasement coins, even when the counterfeiting is done with great care, not only have a slightly imperfect imprint, but also 
differ from the good coins in respect to color, and in the case of gold coins, to their sound when flipping with the thumbnail. Most importantly, the certificates can easily be tested at any time by cutting or punching them, or by melting down the coin. Thus, even for laymen, it is relatively easy to distinguish sound coins from falsifications, or if they only had full notes. Not so in the case of paper certificates. Part 3. The Origins of Fractional Reserve Banking as in the case of debasement, banknotes have been falsified both by ordinary criminals and by the guardians themselves. Banknotes came into existence on a larger scale when money warehouses were established in Venice and other northern Italian cities in the late 16th and then in the number of commercial cities north of the Alps in the early 17th century. For example, Amsterdam, Middlesbrough, Nuremberg, Hamburg, Delft, and Rotterdam. During the 16th century, interregional trade had grown to such an extent that the merchants were in touch with one another, not only during the times of the great fairs, but throughout the entire year. Now it became necessary to settle accounts on a daily basis, and the most practical way of, uh, of doing this through money warehouses. Each merchant held an account and payments from 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 and to other merchants were made by simply book entries at the local money warehouse. See Geoffrey Parker, Die Entstehung der modernen Geld- und Finanzwesen in Europa, 15. bis 17. bis 30. Jahrhundert. The creation of the modern monetary and uh, financial uh, system in Europe from 1500 till 1730. Uh, and Kipola and Kurt Bosch in Europäische Währungsgeschichte, the European Monetary History. Uh, the classical narrative of these events is in Richard Ehrenberg's The Age of the Fuggers, a monetary capital and credit movements in the 16th century. The institutions were called banks, but in their beginning they were not banks, but the, in the modern sense, but money warehouses. Some of them kept their character for a long time. For example, the Bank of Amsterdam, established in 1609, remained a warehouse until 1781, when it started issuing banknotes in excess of its money holdings, yet without changing the outer appearance of the banknotes. Thus, in 1781, the Bank of Amsterdam started counterfeiting its own banknotes. It was no longer a money warehouse. It became a fractional reserve bank. Other banks did not wait nearly as long as the Bank of Amsterdam to enter the lucrative business of counterfeiting. The London goldsmith bankers, who multiplied in the 1630s, very quickly made the move. So did the Bank of Stockholm, established in 1656, which a few years after its inception managed to create a large circulation of its notes. But the same banks was also one of the first to experience the perennial names of the fractional reserve banking, the bank run. The fundamental practical problem of fractional reserves is that it is impossible for the issuing bank to accommodate all the demands for redemption at the same time. The warehouse banks can. If the bank customers have a slightest suspicion that they might not get the money back, they run to the bank to be among the happy few who are still granted redemption of their banknotes. This happened to the Bank of Stockholm in 1664, but it did not stop the proliferation of fractional reserve banking in the subsequent decades and centuries. Thus, fractional reserve banking can arise as a pre-version of money warehouses, or perversion of money warehouses, but it can also originate as a perversion of credit banking, we have already talked about credit money and argued that it is unlikely to have any larger cir circulation because of the default risk of especially because of market participants prefer cash to credit instruments in spot exchange. Now, in order to make good for the latter definition, the banker might offer to redeem his IOU on demand. That is, before maturity is reached. From that point of view of the customer, then the IOU can be turned into cash almost as secure as money certificates. We have to say almost because it would, of course, be impossible for our banker to comply with the redemption request that exceed his cash holdings. 
a problem that cannot arise in money warehousing, where every certificate is backed by a corresponding amount of money in the warehouse. So how does this practice appear from a juridical and moral point of view? It depends on whether the banker is affirmatively candid about the nature of his business. If he takes care of information, his customer had that the redeemable IOUs are not money certificates and that he, the banker, remains the rightful owner of the money for an entire duration of the credit. Then the practice seems to be unobjectionable. By contrast, if he insists, if he insinuates that his IOUs are money certificates, we would certainly have to say that in this case, uh, that this is a case of fraud. Historically, it seems as though this in this simulation has been more important than outright misrepresentation. One of the oldest known paper notes from the Bank of Scotland dated to the 16th April of 1776. We read, the governor and company of the Bank of Scotland constituted by the Act of Parliament do hereby oblige themselves to pay to the name of the or the bearer 12 pounds Scots on demand. The crucial wording here is oblige themselves to pay. On later banknotes, we often find the expression promise to pay. Thus, the least thing we can say is that these notes are mute about the precise nature of the product. They promise to pay is not a feature that would distinguish a credit bank from a money warehouse. Monetary historian Norbert Olzak observes that the first banknotes issued by the Bank of England were certif certificates of deposit. Then the wording of the notes has, was changed and they became promissory notes. This process, or these process, was completed by the middle of the 18th century. Olzak underlines its purpose to get rid of the restrictive coverture metallicu. Um, and this is Norbert Olzak. Mm -hmm. to, keep the to keep the market participants fully informed, it would be necessary to state as clearly as possible whether the promised payment will be made out of a small fractional reserve cash fund or out of a warehouse. Similarly, it would be necessary to state who will consider to be the owner of the money in the case of banker provide to be unable to comply with all redemption requests. If the customers were considered to be the owners of the money, the bankers would be bankrupt in such a case. By contrast, if the bankers were considered to be the owner of money, he would stay in business and one, and one would say that the customers have simply made a bad investment. Present-day legislation in the United States and the United Kingdom endorsed the latter point of view. Few Americans know that the money they keep in their checking account is legally the property of the banks, who have merely an obligation to pay back the money on demand. Not your keys, not your bitcoin. If our credit bankers knowingly and deliberately dissimulate the precise nature of the IOU, he abuses the good faith of his trading partners and thereby infringe upon their property rights. He thereby turns himself into a fractional reserve bank. We mentioned this possible, this possible origin of fractional reserve banking only for the sake of completeness. The question of how this type of business can emerge and how it has emerged historically is of second importance for the argument in the present work. A detailed analysis of fractional reserve banking as a possible preservation of credit banks is in Europe Guido Holtzmann's Has Fractional Reserve Banking Really Passed the Market Test? So far, we have presented fractional reserve banking as springing exclusively from the misguided choices of warehouse managers and credit banksters who fell prey to temptation. But it is also conceivable that these choices were in turn caused by a third event, in particular by the threat of government-sponsored robbing of money warehouses. As Jesus Huerta de Soto has argued, for the case of the 16th century banks of Seville, the ruthlessness of bankers was by no means the only cause for the introduction of fractional reserve principles. And I quote, it's no less true that the inauspicious empirical, 
imperial policy by transgressing the most elementary principle of property rights and directly confiscating the stock of money kept in the vaults, merely providing an even bigger incentive for the banks to invest in greater part of the deposits received in loans, which became a habitual practice. If, in the final analysis, there was no guarantee that the public authorities would respect the part of the cash reserves, which was kept in the banks, and experience showed that when the time was difficult, the emperor did not hesitate to confiscate his reserves and substitute it by compulsory loans to the crown. It was pre uh, preferable to devote the great part of the deposits to loans, to private industry and commerce, thus avoiding expropriating and uh, obtaining greater profitability. And that's in Jesus Huerta de Soto's great book, New Light on the Prehistory of the Treasury of Banking and the School of Salamanca. Thus, the introduction of fractional reserve banking might be seen as free market reaction against an attenuation of government interventionism. It is true that even under the threat of Im imminent appropriation, expropriation, fractional reserve banking might not be justifiable per se. But at least the presence of such threat would diminish the guild of the protagonist, and it would certainly explain their actions in other terms than original sin. Much more historical research is needed to establish the relative importance of the three possible causes of fractional reserve banking that we have discussed in the preceding pages. Preceding pages. There are good reasons to believe that the third cause, government-sponsored robbing of money warehouses, has played a rather pervasive role. But we must not leave the answer to the question for future research. Continuing with part four, indirect benefits of counterfeiting in a free society. Counterfeiting is in the true sense of the word a popular inflation technique. All sorts of people who have dexterous hands and or who can afford to hire people with such hands, banksters, governments, merchants, goldsmiths, aristocrats, etc., can try it out. And the history of money illustrates that the sort of such people have tried it out with the harmful consequences analyzed above. Unjust distribution of income and misallocation of capital. Thus, counterfeiting exists in all types of economies, be it in the free, in the market of a free society, or in the centrally planned economy of a totalitarian state. Unlike fiat money, of which we will speak below, it cannot be abolished through political measures. It can be represented by the prospect of severe punishment, but it cannot be entirely eliminated such, by such external means because it springs from the internal human conditions of original sin. Yet in the free society, counterfeiting is not within certain positive consequences. And even though the counterfeiters themselves do not plan to bring them about, in particular, the very danger of falling prey to the counterfeiters play the useful social function of making the citizens vigilant about their money. Run your note. The function of counterfeiters resemble the function of the many viruses that subsist in a healthy human body. Fighting the virus keeps the body alive and strong, similarly to the ever-present danger of counterfeiting simultaneous vigilance in monetary affairs and thus helps to preserve sound money. People watch their gold and silver coins closely because they know that counterfeiting affects them directly. They strive to learn more about distinguishing good coins from bad coins and good banknotes from bad ones. They apply such knowledge and teach it to their families and others. And once they discover any sort of fraud, they stop using the fraudulent coins and banknotes and switch to other certificates. Counterfeiting is usually detected very quickly. When people are free to choose their money, it cannot create much damage. But this important natural limitation on inflation exists only in a free society, as we shall see in more detail. The Ethics of Counterfeiting, Chapter 5. 
Debasement of the fractional reserve banking are unjustifiable. No theory of ethical defense, lies, or for that matter, counterfeiting. It is true that a few moral philosophers have tried to justify lies that are meant to prevent greater harm, but which, uh, but which harm could be avoided through counterfeiting? Or does counterfeiting convey any special advantage to the community of money users? Nobody has ever ventured to answer these questions affirmatively, and thus we do not deal with them here. As far as counterfeiting per se is concerned, there cannot be the slightest doubt about the Christian stance. The Eighth Commandment tells us about intentional falsifications of certificates. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And many other passages from the Old Testament spell out what this means in the context of certificates that attest the quantities of precious metals. Do not act dishonestly in using measurement or length or, or weight or capacity. You shall have a true scale and true weights or honest ifa, ipa, and an honest hint. I, the Lord, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And that is Leviticus in 1935-36. till 36. You shall not keep two different weights in your back, one large and one small. Nor shall you keep two different measurements in your house, one large and the other small. But use a true and just weight and a true and just measure that you may have a long life and the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Everyone who is dishonest in any of these matters is an abomination to the Lord your God. Varying ways, varying measures are both an abomination to the Lord, and varying weights are an abomination to the Lord, and false scales are not good. In the Proverbs 20, 10, and 23. These general ethical principles were applied with great rigor in the case of money in Nicholas Resmi's treatise. The author noted that falsifying the imprint of a coin was a penal offense and even a legitimate cause of war. He held that a change of names, a debasement, was scandalous and should never be done. An alteration of the weight without changing the name was similarly a foul lie and a fraudulent cheat. And that is Nicholas Eresme in the great treatise on the origin, nature, law, and alteration of money. Bishop Eresme made no exception for his condemnation of false money certificates. Even the government could not, for any reason, falsify money certificates and thus inflate the money supply. He argued that any alteration of money through the government was unjust in itself and that the government necessarily gained at the expense of the community. As we have seen, Ptolemy of Luca made the much weaker point that the community would lose through alteration of the coinage because such alteration changed the standard measurement on the government of rulers. This harm corresponds to the damage created by meddling with measurements of length, temperature, etc. However, Oresmi saw that more was at stake here. The alteration of coinage involved a physical transfer of money from the community to the government. The government thus turns into a tyrant. And I quote, from the measurement, when the prince usurps the essentially un just privilege. It is impossible that he can justly take profit from it. Besides, the amount of the prince's profit is necessarily that of the community's loss. But whatever loss the prince inflicts on the community is injustice and the act of tyrants and not of a king, as Aristotle says. And if he should tell the tyrant's usual lie that he applies the profit to the public advantage, he must not be believed because he might as well take my coat and say he needed it for the public service. And St. Paul says that we are not 
to do evil that good may come. Nothing, therefore, should be extorted on the pretense that it will be used for good purposes afterwards. Oresmi's Treatise, chapter 15, page 24. The text refers to Aristotle is politics and the Nicomachean ethics, as well as the St. Paul's letter to Romans in 3.8. Oresmi repeatedly made his point, stressing that the function of inflation is to enrich the government at the expense of other people. Oresmi argued that debasement could only be licit when two conditions were simultaneously given. One, there would have to be a great emergency. And two, the entire community, not just the government, would have to give its consent. Government should get its regular revenue elsewhere. Very similar, Ludwig von Mises argued that inflation, by its very nature, contradicted the principle of popular sovereignty. The only way for the people to keep their government in check was to control the government's resources. If the government needed more money, therefore, it should approach the citizens to pay higher taxes. Inflation, the money supply provided, is it with more resources than the citizens were ready to contribute. And that is in the second best book on monetary economics after the ethics of money production. It's the theory of money and credit. Or as me stressed here, a fundamental fact that we have pointed out above, that additional money benefits the first owner at the expense of all other money owners. It is true that this is so irrespective of whether the additional money results from natural production or from inflation. But inflation is not just an extension of the money supply. The crucial point is that it extends the money supply through a violation of property rights. And inflation provides no just gain. It provides illegitimate gains. Its alleged benefits are not really different from the benefits of robbery or fraud. Therefore, there seems to be good grounds for arguing that inflation, independent of any attenuating circumstances, is an inherent bad action, intrinsici malum, in the sense of Catholic, Catholic moral doctrine. See on this point, John Paul II. Oresmi argued that counterfeiting was a far more serious moral offense than the sins that are most frequently associated with the use of money, namely money changing and usury. Money changing and usury might be tolerable under certain special circumstances, but counterfeiting was inherently unjust and therefore never permissible. It actually simulated money changing, it actually stimulated money changing and further counterfeiting by the people who seized on the general confusion created by the initial counterfeiter. And that is Oresmi's in his great treatise. And also St. Thomas took it for granted that money foregoes, these, foregoes deserve death in Summa Theologica. Piers, thank you very much for joining me here on Chapter 6, The Private Inflation, Counterfeiting, and Money Certificates of the Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Hultzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much, as always, for joining me here, and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.